a lot along the way, of course, we'll learn something not just about therapy, but we'll learn something biologically in fact, in that Now, you've seen these sorts of charts drawn out to leading to what's your favorite cell type at the end here. But this is just one system using pluripotential stem cells that might go down in a training process to lead to beta cells. One big question in the field has been, can we ever make mature beta cells by this type of a process? The process is very complicated, sequential application of complex cocktails, which have to be timed. They're always being modified, a little bit of tweaking here or there can give rise to more or uh, different numbers of uh, endocrine cells. But on the whole, the cells that have been produced so far are immature. There has been a seminal paper perhaps published just recently by Paul Gadu, which I'd like you to check out if you're interested where he showed that maybe making the correct type of definitive endoderm, a very early step in going down to the pancreatic and then beta cell lineage, that making the correct type of definitive endoderm was the most important step, because his paper purportedly is reporting that uh, beta cells derived from his special type of definitive endoderm are actually mature. They don't have this immature phenotype, which is reported by multiple papers in the past. So that's, that's an issue here, which we're very concerned about making the authentic types of cell versus the, uh, something which might be a sort of poor imitation. And the other things that we're interested about, and actually more towards the tone of the talk today, is being able to move backwards from mature cells. And there has been a long-standing controversy, and I will go back into this towards the end of the talk, about whether or not there, there could be distributed facultative progenitors along the duct uh, cells of the mature pancreas how many of them are there, whether they're focal, whether they're uh, somewhere here in this central acinar cell region or in the intercalated ducts, or if they're in the mature ducts proper, in the bigger ducts down here, is a sort of question for the lineage tracers amongst us to get into. Um, but if we could find these cells, whether or not they're in uh, these locations here, or maybe, as I'll tell you in the second half of my talk, whether the acinar cells could be convinced to become facultative, multi progenitors, one would be interested, for example, in taking these cells out, isolating them, finding ways of expanding them, releasing from them from their cell cycle block, and then maybe ex vivo pushing them into directed differentiation. Uh, we might be able to find ways of inducing proliferation from the actual beta cells themselves. That's seeming to be a very uh, hard block to overcome. They seem beta cells seem to have entered a pretty hard state of replicative uh, block and really not be able to push into uh, reproliferation. But here's the possibility I'd like to return to then for the focus of the talk, the induced reprogramming, perhaps, of glucagon producing alpha cells into beta cells to solve the problem of loss of beta cells in type 1 and type 2 diabetes, or of asthma cells converting those into endocrine cells. This one is pretty convincing. This one is a very beginning story. And um, I'll try and tell you some of our future experiments, which will hopefully increase the possibility of changing asthma cells into endocrine cells, uh, like I said, towards the second half of my talk. So for those of you who think about organogenesis, I think that this is the same as working on the eye, the same as working in the nervous system, spinal cord, whatever. We're interested in how progenitors become allocated to specific phase and then go through the right numbers of cell divisions and the right numbers of cell types that are generated to give rise to the proper mature organ in its uh, full glory. And so we got very interested in the pancreas from a very serendipitous discovery of the gene PDX1 back when I worked on, I still work on Xenopus, but back when I worked on Xenopus in uh, Basel when homeopox genes were first being discovered and we found the gene PDX1. PDX1 is expressed in the vertebrate in a very conserved fashion in the foregut endoderm territory. So a little bit of the stomach, duodenum, common bile duct, and the pancreas that emerges from that region. We then got to work on a gene called PTF1A, which is exquisitely selective within that domain for the pancreas territory. And we showed that if you remove PTF1A, you could switch these pancreatic cells into intestinal progenitors. So we started to play games with these factors that if you flip them, them on or off, would cause, for example, in the inactivation condition, the complete absence of pancreatic growth. Or when we inactivated them, we could see not only loss of pancreas, but we could see switching of the progenitors to another cell state. And so we'd like to know more in the future about the epigenetic configurations that are associated with those transitions. But the two genes gave us an entry point into at least understanding multi progenitors in a very interesting process of how they change now from being multi 
into specific progenitor classes for the endocrine cells, the duct cells, or the actin cells. I find pancreas organogenesis a very interesting concept, so I'm going to tell you for a couple of moments here why I find it so fascinating. Uh, these multipotent progenitors, which come from this primitive duct tube here, sort of form a little solid bud here, and I'm only showing you one of the pancreatic buds here just for clarity. But uh, if you look a little bit later, and these are embryonic stages from the mouse shown here with the E numbers, what you can see is this is a stratified epithelium where this is the uh, lumen which connects back into the duodenal lumen here. You start to see early on this process of microcavitation where cells form microlumens here. Uh, apical surfaces are distinguished on certain cells which are then passed to their neighbors. And these microlumens appear in multiple spots within this solid uh, pseudostratified epithelium, which then form and join together and coalesce, form into these uh, sort of networks of uh, lumens distributed throughout the entire organ mass. And then there's a very important stage that we have to get to grips with, which is this plexus intermediate. Now, who knows in this room about mammary gland, prostate, and salivary gland, branching organs, kidney? Branching morphogenesis is a process where things come out and then split and move again, grow into and extend like this by a more and more ramifying process. This is not like that. This is more like uh, a vascular plexus. It eventually is going to be an epithelial tree. So this vascular plexus is a mixture of cells that are already at this time on here distributing themselves into pools who are endocrine and duct bipotent and some residual cells who have multipotency that are in various locations. And we have to learn more about this plexus because the entire pancreas formed by internal and external kind of growth and expansion in a plexus intermediate stage. And then there is some selective loss, some special process of loss of some of these branch connectors, maintenance of other ones of them that eventually give rise to this epithelial tree, which is necessary because you're going to have the acinar cells, which cap off at the end here, these multipotent cells, remember the stuff here, multipotency is then residing in these cells that are distributed in this so far undefined pattern in this plexus. But eventually, these multipotent cells, which can be tracked because they are PTF1A low and PDX1 positive, turn into the acinar cells, capping off the ends of this beautiful epithelial tree, and basically enzymes who have to get all the way back down into the duodenum. So this epithelial tree has to make sense. These islets of Larnahan's clusters bud off of these ducts, and the whole system is coming from this plexus. So I think that we have to get grips with very high resolution single cell or cluster cell resolution, not global looking at the pancreas architecture, but understanding the tiling of equivalence units across this plexus. The asynchronous nature of this plexus is kind of a challenge, but once we understand the tiling and we can understand whether five cells talk to each other or clusters of 10 cells talk to each other, we might be able to then really focus on issues of uh, tip multipotency versus endocrine duct bipotency, the influence of notch, PCP pathways, etc., in defining who is going to go where, how these uh, branches sometimes get lost, how some get maintained, and eventually how you produce the right numbers of these cell types. This is not accurate, right? The, the numbers of islets of Langerhans in this uh, diagram is way too high. In the adult organ, 2% of the mass is islet of Langerhans endocrine cells, and the, most of it is acinar cells, about 80% of the rest of the cells. So that's beautifully built in all of us every time, right? By a program that we have to understand. So we want to understand that. Um, how are we going to understand that? Well, biochemist in me wants to smash things up and homogenize everything, and, but the other part of me wants to do things all in real time, watching cells move with respect to each other. So I think there's going to be a balance of that. And um, I think the other approach is to always be reductionist. And so I've drawn for you a little diagram here, which moves a cell from the foregut through the pancreas, the proendocrine state, onto an endocrine committed progenitor who has the ability to form the somatostatin, insulin, glucagon, ghrelin, or pancreatic polypeptide producing final endocrine hormone cell types. This pancreatic progenitor can also choose, as I showed you in that last diagram, to go off into the pro-duct or the pro-acinar route and uh, form these differentiated cell types up here. There's another choice earlier from the foregut stage to go into other organ phase. So what we want to do is break this down and understand 
can we sort of break it down into modules, gene repertory modules? And I should emphasize that this corresponds to transcription factor-based gene repertory networks, as well as the intercellular signals, which are very complicated, that inter interface with those and cause the very specific up and down titration of those uh, internal, intrinsic gene repertory networks. I'm really interested in the conversion for today's talk of um, the cell types out here, because if we can understand this process, we might be able to understand how modules which drive specific aspects, for example, this pathway or this pathway, how we might be able to um, engage plasticity to change between beta and delta cells. I have a very interesting project in the lab which seems to be able to convert beta into delta cells. I can't tell you details about that today. But I will tell you about our experiments converting uh, alpha into beta cells. So this is close cousin reprogramming, right? These are almost like um, uh, very close cousin uh, replacements. And the other one is to think about asiner to uh, beta cell, kind of distant cousin relationships, or even more distant familial relationships, trying to convert liver into pancreas. And for those of you who know this field, you'll know that people can put transcription factors or other molecules into the liver and can show some ability of these cells to turn on insulin expression. They don't form authentic beta cells. So remember what I told you, authentic beta cells are very different from immature ones. And just showing that insulin can be expressed is very different from showing that you've really reprogrammed the cell at a deeper level. Uh, you know about papers from Joe Zhao and Doug Melton where acinar cells can be forced by transcription factors delivered by an adenovirus born cocktail. Three transcription factors can work together to essentially convert acinar cells into beta cells in a very nice paper published by Joe. I'm going to tell you about uh, the first part of my talk, this part here, and then in the end, I'm going to tell you about a non-transcription factor-based uh, study which seems to show some inherent capacity of these asthma cells to become facultative multipotent progenitors. So again, the first part of my talk, I'm going to talk about the context-dependent alpha to beta endocrine cell plasticity that we can detect in the pancreas, diverting glucagon into insulin-producing cells. I'm going to talk to you about response differences in turning on a transcription factor, PDX1, who's not only part of the multipotent progenitor pool uh, transcription factor defining population in the early embryo, but is maintained in the beta cell. And I'm going to show you the effects of turning on PDX1 in progenitor stage that are very different, and I think surprisingly excitingly different from the uh, results of turning it on in the mature glucagon producing sort of mature endocrine cell type in the mature animal. And the second part of the talk is going to talk about acinar to duct and endocrine reprogramming under injury. And I'll tell you that there are special facultative properties that are related to this PTF1A uh, PDX1 double positive status. Some ideas that this represents a return of the acinar cells to an early multipotent state. Uh, ideas that this might have uh, implications on the acinar cells of having a convertible epigenetic architecture, which means that we can grab hold of that maybe in a pharmacological basis, small molecule screening in the future. And then um, also that this may indicate and be the complement of experiments which are performed by multiple people, some of whom are collaborating with very uh, nicely, showing that the cell of origin in pancreatic duct lab of carcinoma is likely the acinar cell and not the duct cell or central acinar cell. So there's linked uh, concepts going on here again to plasticity and cancer and developmental programs. Okay, so the first part of the talk uh, is, is really rather simple, and I'm going to try to go over it with some kind of higher level viewpoint, because I think you've seen the paper, this is in Genes and Development uh, last year. And um, really in summary, <clears throat> the question turns out to be this, from a sort of therapeutic angle. If making beta cells is difficult, and I won't go into all the reasons why it's difficult, but it is difficult, making mature beta cells in vitro. If, it's make, if making beta cells is difficult, what about making alpha cells in huge vats that you can carry around in buckets from lab to lab and then convert those into beta cells relatively easily? So that's um, maybe what we might be able to do, given that we sh show, I'll show you we can convert alpha cells into beta cells very effectively by a simple, um, simple uh, manipulation. Pancreatic multiple progenitors have the ability to turn into acinite duct or enter this endocrine progenitor state. I'm not going to show you the data today at all, but we think that there is a very important endocrine biased state where the neurogenin 3 gene just becomes switched on at a very low level. And this is a proliferative 
feeder population, a mitotic population, who feeds the production of neurogenin 3 high cells, who are precursors. So by some form of asymmetric cell division, these cells enter the neurogenin 3 high cell division in one of the daughters. And this cell commits then, by a process, a really unknown process at the moment, to choose to go into the delta PP or ghrelin uh, cell type. And for our purposes today, I've just divided the rest into alpha versus beta. So really don't concern yourself with that up here. We're just talking about this switch. If PBX is um, turned up from this state here to a high level, these cells become beta cells. If the PBX1 gene stays at a low level, the cells become either alpha cells or these other cell types up here. Okay? We think that what we're doing in our manipulation is coming into this population here and turning on PDX1 to a high level. And we're going to ask, what happens? Does everything now flow into beta cells? Or do any other more interesting things happen at this part of the cell ontology pathways? So this experiment is very simple. We turn PDX1 on in all of these cells. Whether or not they're going to turn into these, normally we turn on PDX1 to a high level in all of these cells. I'm going to show you that we can, if we do it at this stage, divert these late arising glucagon expressing cells to insulin producing cells. So there's, there's a late alpha to beta reprogramming. Even though we turned on PDX1 here, these cells get formed as alpha cells and then only postnatally seem to switch rather rapidly into beta cells. So it's a cryptic type of reprogramming that we think we're causing in these alpha cell progenitors. They get born as alpha cells, they live in the animal until the end of organogenesis, the end of embryogenesis, and then rather surprisingly suddenly decide to notice PDX1 in their chromatin and say, oh, that's interesting, time to switch completely, move into the beta cell state. On the other hand, if you turn on PDX1 only in the mature alpha cells, key aspects of an alpha cell are unprogrammed, so you lose glucagon expression, for example but they don't make any further move into the beta cell condition. And I'll tell you towards the end of this part of the talk, we got some recently surprising data which are really, really exciting on how to release them from that block to go forward into beta cells. So we're learning things about when to block and how cryptic reprogramming happens and how signals are given to cells to make conversions even though transcription factors have been inside the cell for many, many days. Okay. Okay, so uh, this is just another way of forming this hypothesis, which is that cells uh, are making this decision to move from the uh, multipotent progenitor state here, not into the ductal or acinar uh, condition, but to move into this neurogenically low mitotic pool, whose level of PDX1 is low. That when they move into this precursor state, neurogenically high, PDX1 moves from low to high as it enters the pre-beta cell condition and then moves up into the full mature beta cell insulin secreting state, glucose responsive insulin secreting state. There are markers that we know that are associated with the mature state, such as MAFA, other markers as well. We don't really have a genomic RNA-seq expression profile, but we're moving that way because you'd like to know exactly how similar they are. Uh, so <clears throat> the idea is that normally other endocrine programs are down here because PDX1 is going to stay at low and would end up going into the alpha or delta other cell types. We're going to force PDX1 high and watch what happens over time and see if we see evidence for conversion back this way. The point is that PDX1 overexpression begins very close to the time of birth of endocrine cells in this endocrine biased progenitor state. Okay? It's a really simple experiment. You guys have seen this experiment loads of times in your own reading of the literature. We use a flox stuffer sequence in this um, CAG promoter uh, construct so that when Cree is present, that goes out. The CAG promoter then drives a flag tag version of PDX1 here. So we use neurogenin 3 driven by a beautiful back transgenic Randy Leiter which drives expression in those progenitors, those mitotic progenitors, and some of the other transgenics are not as certain to do that. This is a back transgenic which has tons of regulatory sequence in it. We think that's the reason why it's working so well. So what this is going to do is going to activate flag PDX1 expression in all cell types which express neurogenin 3, those endocrine bias progenitors. Irrespective of what they would have already done, they're going to have PDX1 in them. And we can see it because of the flag tag. The first experimental result that came back from uh, Yuping Yang in my lab 
was in adults, where she showed me that the controls here are um, the normal architecture of the mouse island, uh, is to have glucagon cells distributed in the periphery, beta cells in the, in the uh, core. And you can see here that this is an adult from the uh, transgenic here, where the PDX1 can be detected by this flag tag in all these cells. And you see complete absence of glucagon producing cells. So in the adult, no glucagon producing cells. Lots of questions. How can an animal live without glucagon? Don't know the answer to that yet. We're still studying that. Your question should be how much are you overexpressing the transcription factor? We hate gain and function experiments. Are you killing cells? What are you doing to them? These beta cells are very, very happy. They live forever, basically, as long as the mouse lives. And um, there's maybe about two-fold overexpression by Western block considerations. And these mice remain euglycemic. So again, these beta cells are not dysfunctional. Why they can live without glucagon, there's different stories to get into, different hypotheses, but the beta cells still look good. So we're not having a really deleterious overexpression effect, okay? So no glucagon producing cells in the adult, but if you go back into embryogenesis and score a few certain stages that just drawn out for um, uh, examples here, you score the number of glucagon producing cells, what you can see is in controls as a fraction of the total number of glucagon plus, ins plus insulin producing cells. That number goes down. This is largely because the number of insulin cells being born in later gestation is overwhelming the number of alpha cells who are formed in two sort of overlapping spectrum, like there's alpha cells first and beta cells kind of take over. But if you score that in the control, you see this pattern here where you get a large number left in this mantle um, in the normal island. And you can see there's a gradual loss of these glucagon producing cells in this uh, PDX1 overexpression condition. I want you to notice here, this is at the time when that progenitor pool, that biased progenitor pool, first becomes apparent in the pancreas in that plexus stage. And you can see that there is about 20% reduction here uh, in the alpha cell uh, number. So we think that during endocrine allocation, early events in that neurogenin 3 expressing state, there is some choice of cells away from the alpha cell condition. But 80% of the cells last until later stages when at P1, what you start to see is this vast decrease here. A rapid perinatal loss of the glucagon alpha cells and an alpha to beta reprogramming, it actually moves through the alpha uh, beta cell intermediate state where you can detect specifically insulin glucagon double expression and other markers which are supposed to go away during uh, maturation of the different cell types are present in these cells. So this is just, a, again, an example. This, these are published data, so I just want to pick out the most kind of evocative nugget you should take away with you. This is <coughs> the overexpression condition, the control here. Uh, this is the PDX1 channel just drawn out alone, so you can get an appreciation for the levels of expression in the overexpression compared to the normal situation. And you can see the glucagon producing cells here are completely devoid of PDX1 and nuclear protein. Here, if you focus on that, you can see the glucagon mantle has got, and just a few highlighted here, has got PDX1 in it. So PDX1 is not, the presence of PDX1 is not completely blocking the production of an alpha cell phenotype. It's able to move down the alpha cell phenotype, come out at E18, and even at P1, we can see these cells present, okay? Now, they're moving through this glucagon insulin producing double uh, sort of positive intermediate state. Later on, we only see the presence of insulin producing cells. So these cells, these glucagon insulin double positive cells get replaced completely by insulin positive cells. They are completely unable to be distinguished as far as we can tell from any of the normal beta cells that are in the core of the island. Now, there's, if you've been following me, some of you are experts in lineage tracing, you're going to ask me, have you lineage traced the cells that were alpha cells and shown that they actually turn into beta cells? And can you sort those cells out as a population and tell me something about those cells? Remember, that's hard for us to do right now because we use CRE from Neurogenic 3 to turn on the PDX1 overexpression. And we can't use a, a two-level two kind of turn on of another CRE to, to do the lineage tracing. We don't detect any evidence for any cell death around the islet, and in the mantle, you would think you would detect that cell death very easily because it's localized, and you would expect to see it happening rather rapidly in that few-day period postnatally. We'd see none of that. But we are trying to build an experiment in our minds 
put ourselves in on how we will do a two-level experiment, which will allow us to sort those cells out during the reprogramming. Because we want to watch the epigenetic dynamics happen within those cells. We want to understand the pioneer loci, which cell, which loci are occupied by PDX1 in this cryptic period where they haven't converted, but are maybe sitting there, ready, primed for switching into the beta cell configuration. And there is a way of setting that up. For those of you in the pancreas field, there is a way of setting that up, and we're trying to set that up with an ARX pre-ER type experiment, which will allow us to turn on PDX1 overexpression only within the alpha cell lineage and will allow us to trace those cells out at the end at different time points, excluding the normal beta cells. Okay, so here's the summary of really the first part of the talk then, which is that what you have to imagine is that there's a process in this epithelium, this is the basal surface. These are these neurogenin three low cells that I've been referring to, these mitotic feeder cells who give rise by some type of asymmetric cell division to these neurogenin three high cells. Now, some of them are going to go off and form beta cells and some to uh, alpha. And I've just drawn those as two separate uh, railroad tracks up here. There's one moving from the lower to high neurogenin 3 to a PAC6 intermediate and on into the adult mature beta cell. There's another cell which is moving into the alpha cell intermediate. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, sorry, the alpha cell condition. And what we've done is by turning on neurogenin 3 CRE with um, the back. We now have seen an absence of about 20% of the cells moving to an alpha cell uh, fate. So we think that there is an early stage where we are able to sort of convince, coax some of these cells to go this way and enter the beta cell program relatively early. But on the whole, what you remember is that at least 80% of those cells last until the postnatal perinatal period and then undergo this full rapid reprogramming through this intermediate out into mature beta cells. I want to contrast that for you with this experiment where we used either glucagon CRE as a transgenic to turn on PDX1 in a glucagon producing cell state but in the embryo, or we use a doxycycline regulated system to turn on PDX1 overexpression in a mature glucagon producing cell in the adult animal. Okay, so in embryonic or in adult glucagon producing cells, you don't get this conversion to the uh, beta cell condition you get unprogrammed. The unprogramming is happening even when PDX is present in uh, competition with ARX. ARX, to some of you, is a famous factor, right? ARX is thought to be the alpha cell specification factor. And I think we're learning something about the potency of transcription factors in defining cell states here. PDX1 and ARX in the same cell type, PDX1 is kind of acting as a little hammer and suppressing the effects of ARX, it's dominant over ARX is another way of saying that. It maybe represses more genes than ARX has the ability to activate in diverting, in ARX diverting the cell into the alpha cell pathway, PDX may be able to dominantly repress genes that are important for becoming an alpha cell, or at least some latter aspects of becoming an alpha cell. We get glucagon turned off. We get this factor MAFB turned off. And there's this methyl transferase, which I hope you've been reading about over here while I've been chatting to you, which is um, uh, interesting, set nut 79 which is cytoplasmic in alpha cells and in beta cells is nuclear. It's really important for transcribing and setting up the chromatin configuration for multiple genes involved in keeping a beta cell a beta cell. And you see this uh, factor move from the cytoplasm, the alpha cell pathway, to the nucleus, the beta cell kind of pattern. And so what we're seeing here is PDX1 able to do some things to these alpha cells, kind of disturb them, but they don't move forward. And um, so we contrast that then, early expression, a cryptic form of reprogramming, which allows them to be born and then full, re full and rapid reprogramming. This uh, progenitor stage, PDX1 overexpression, is a short period of an alpha cell's life, only up here, a tiny period. It then goes to a long time period before it suddenly notices PDX1 in the chromatin nucleus and then undergoes reprogramming and then undergoes a late explicit full conversion. But if there's none of this early priming, and I should emphasize the difference between this early priming here and the glucagon expressing condition here is also a relatively short time period. There's something going on that we need to break down epigenetically, chromatin regulation, pioneer loci, whatever it is. And we will do this, but we need to really understand specific cell states and how to pull them out 
and then access and interrogate the chromatin and the genes. But if there is none of this early priming, and you even turn the gene off on here, uh, PDH1 to a high level here, or turn on here, you see several aspects of unprogramming, but no move towards this uh, beta cell fate. It's uh, very interesting to think, big picture, what are these late developmental signals that happen in this postnatal period? These cells are sat there, something signals to them. Is it timed autonomously? Can we take those cells out? put them in culture? Do they time that process autonomously? Or are there developmental signals coming because of nutritional status change? The animal just got born. That's a big stress for the animal, right? And also it's going into a different uh, kind of feeding state. And so there could be connections with the uh, entire endocrine axis that we need to be aware of. But I, I'm very interested by thinking about, I already alluded to this point to, to you earlier, this alpha cell uh, kind of period of birth in the embryo versus the beta cell period of birth. In the perinatal period, there are some rapid changes that occur here. One is this MAF A, MAF B resolution period, which happens postnatally, perinatally, postnatally, where MAF B gets turned off in the uh, uh, beta cell in the mouse, and MAF A gets turned up to a higher level and more uniformly to a high level in the beta cells. So two transcription factors are responding in the perinatal period to something happening. And again, I don't know if it's autonomously timed or some type of developmental signal. But it's interesting to think about this being exactly the time when these cells switch over in their own minds as to what they're actually supposed to be. Switch completely, I'm proposing, from an alpha cell to a beta cell condition. Okay, so that gives you some background here, some kind of other references to the literature. You should remember that Fabrizio Terrell and Pedro Herrera, who are some of our collaborators that I um, annotated on the first slide, have previously reported that if you destroy 99% of the beta cells using diphtheria toxin in a special transgenic system, about 25% of the returning beta cells were derived from the alpha cell state. So they have evidence for alpha cell to beta cell plasticity when you deeply kill beta cells. 95% killing didn't work, 99% killing caused this transformation, okay? Patrick Colomba and Ahmed Mansouri's lab showed using a PAX4 overexpression system that they could make progenitors turn into alpha cells in very large numbers, but then that these would diff, drift off in, rather quickly actually into beta cells, which would sort of stimulate the cycle to go again, and they get these progenitors forming more alpha cells and undergoing the production of beta cell in a cyclical fashion which build these huge islands. So there's several examples here of alpha cells being able to turn into beta cells. The question then comes uh, up, which are really is, is deeper than it looks here. Are alpha cells relatively <coughs> open to change? What is it about them which leads them to be quite plastic under these various situations? Some injury, some transcription factor imposed. Could it occur in low levels in vivo as a homeostatic mechanism? I'm, I'm proposing that maybe in our bodies right now, alpha cells may be transdifferentiating into beta cells homeostatically. In a diabetic person, when you're getting beta cell lesions, maybe alpha cells are converting into beta cells slightly. And we could maybe find ways of getting, using drugs or molecules to accentuate that rate. Now, we don't know that, but we've got programs in my lab in collaboration with Alan Powers and other members of BCBC, Beta Cell Biology Consortium, to study human tissue specifically and to try and ex export some of these ideas into human tissue. And Klaus Kessner's lab, I think is very interesting, is reporting that there is a bivalent state of the PDS1 regulatory chromatin in the alpha cell. So even in a mature alpha cell, it's not fully repressed. It's sitting in this state that could be relatively quickly switched over into a full-scale uh, activation up to a high level, which could then impose a transdifferentiation paradigm. Anyway, in, in uh, conclusion, I say from this first part, understanding alpha beta into conversion could have potential translational application. We might be able to intervene using small molecules to rebalance the alpha to beta proportions in people who are losing their beta cells. We might be able to do this even repetitively to come, the person can come back to the clinic and have drug treatments over and over as a part of teasing some of their alpha cells into the beta cell population. Okay, so I told you this already, this, this is now becoming sort of rather surprisingly easy, right? It used to be in the past thought that there was an iron curtain between alpha cells and beta cells. You could not 
into converge. This is relatively simple. You can move beta cells back into glucagon producing cells from work by Laurie Sussel and Daniel Bouchon. So the idea now is could we use some of these rules? Our goal is to understand the rules and then find out can we put these rules into late stage reprogramming from either IPS or ES cells and make tons of alpha cells and then convert them into beta cells. Um, I'd like to leave you with one of the most exciting things that we discovered in the last few months, which is I told you that the adult alpha cells when undergoing PDX1 high uh, forced expression didn't reprogram, they unprogrammed. And the questions are very, um, I think, lofty, but I think we need to really focus on it. What is resisting this plasticity and can it be relaxed? And along those lines, what we've done is to ask, what if we could find ways to allow those blocked cells to transform completely into beta cells? And remember, all we're doing here is inducing unprogrammed alpha cells in the islet mantle of an adult mice. We're using that tetracycline regulated DOX system, right, with the RTTA. And then we're going to destroy the endogenous beta cells with this diphtheria toxin uh, method that Pedro Herrera has. And when that is done, what you get is a surprising 100% conversion of those unprogrammed cells now into insulin producing cells. So they can sit there in the mantle of the island in this unprogrammed state for a long time, several months by the data that's emerged so far. And then you can diphtheria toxin destroy the core of the island and these cells charge forward into producing the full beta cell phenotype. So again, there's a block to plasticity, it moved halfway in, and we found a way of relaxing it. I think that there's a simple kind of conclusion one can make from this. Here's the normal situation. This is the glucagon based PDX1 overexpression showing these red uh, uh, alpha cells in this unprogrammed state. You destroy these core cells and then these all charge forward into the beta cells. Now, the simple uh, question comes from this. There's some type of uh, repressive influence. Can we find out what that is? Is it a repressive influence from these beta cells themselves or is it something else to do with the lesion that's been imposed? That diphtheria toxin killing could be doing other things. But it could be that there's a repressive influence by these on these cells here, preventing them from changing completely. And we've removed that, and now they move forward. You can imagine that we're super excited to get in, pull these cells out at different stages, and ask, why are they blocked? And then you do this diphtheria toxin release. What suddenly changes? What happens in the first 15 minutes? What happens in the next two hours? So we really want to get into that collaboratively with papers now. Okay, let me um, move then to the last part of my talk, which is to, and I'm going to go over this very briefly because it's just coming up. Um, it just gives you a kind of flavor about this acinar to beta cell conversion phenotype that we're picking up on. Um, it's not a full story, and I want to present it that way. It's just the tip of the iceberg on where I think we'll be, hopefully, with new people coming into the lab in the next uh, two or three years. So again, this is distant cousin reprogramming, acinar to uh, beta cells, right? And where our experiments took off from was this very nice paper from Harry Heinberg's lab. And uh, we worked collaboratively with Harry and also Jean Beaujou. Uh, my postdoc went to Belgium to drink beer, it's a joke, but actually in between drinking Belgian beer, which she loves, she did a couple of experiments. And what she did was she followed him, Jean Beaujou, in how to do partial gut ligation, which I'll tell you about in a moment exactly what it is. It's really trivial. I say that, and now if I try to do it, I kill the animal every time, I guarantee you. She can do it really well. What happened was in this paper, they showed uh, evidence for neurogenin 3 positive cells. Again, remember that uh, endocrine committed progenitor pool being able to be made by neogenesis from the duct population when a mouse undergoes, undergoes partial duct ligation. And that these neurogenin 3 cells could be taken ex, sorry, ex vivo and shown to be able to uh, opt and to derive endocrine cells from them. So these neurogenin 3 cells were produced from the ducts went on to form mature beta cells. Nice paper. It was really nice to see pancreas papers coming out in cell again. I don't know what's happening with cell. I sometimes think I don't understand what's happening with all the journals, but it's nice to see papers in your field come out in the good journals, right? Sometimes it's difficult to imagine what's going on. There. So this is this this is fair. This this slide was clearly made in Chris, at Christmas time last year, right? So so this is a festive version of PDL, partial gut ligation where you tie a little pretty bow around the major duct 
here. And what happens is there's this kind of pancreatitis effect where the asinine, asinine at the end get challenged and undergo an involution process, but most of them die. And uh, so these are the asinine, remember that diagram I showed you at the beginning of the talk? And they turn, some, most, most of them die, but some of them turn into these tubular complexes here, which are sat right at the very tips of these ducts. And so this acidic evolution, new ducts. Now our question is going to be, what happens out here? Can we detect any evidence for a cell which is PTF1A expressing? And I'm going to tell you right now, PTF1A is expressed in the adult only in the acidic cells. It's not expressed in these central acidic cells, which are an internal sheath sticking up into the acidic cluster. It's not expressed in the duct, and it's not expressed at all in any of the endocrine cells. So our lineage tracing using PTF1A pre-ER is only picking up cells derived from the acinar pool. Our PTF1A expressing cells capable of reprogramming and moving off into duct or endocrine cells or even entering into these preformed islet clusters. And we've done some experiments that have taken a long number of months to do. But what we're finding is evidence that those cells can transdifferentiate into asthma, into endocrine cells without any imposition of transcription factors. I mentioned Joe Zhao's paper from Doug Martin's lab. That used three transcription factors with adenoviruses to force them into the beta cell pathway. This is no transcription factors coming on. This is just doing partial duct ligation and asking in an injury type response what happens to challenge that asthma cell. You know these kind of timelines. Every graduate student who's gone through their qualifying exam has seen these types of timelines, right? We take animals which are five weeks old. We use the R26R YFP reporter uh, uh, maps. <coughs> we cross this and use tamoxifen dosing on a PTF1A pre-ER, which is beautifully behaved. Uh, we use a high level of pulsing because we want to drive the labeling of the acinar cells to a very high proportion. Most of the cells die, and we want to be concerned in tracking, even if only a few percent of those cells can turn into endocrine cells, we want to capture them. So we push the numbers to between 80 and 90% labeling with this system. And then we wait a couple of weeks for the tamoxifen to go away, and we do the partial duct ligation, and then wait a number of weeks, and then analyze and see what happens. We're going to sample, in our case, we sample a lot of the pancreas, and it's important for quantitative aspects <coughs> later. We're going to do comparisons between injury alone and injury plus other insults. The main uh, conclusion, and I'm not showing you any of the data really for this, the main conclusion is that partial duct ligation alone causes many of the acetides to become ducts. Those ducts are very stable, they live for a long time. Neurogenin 3 is activated within those tubular complexes that are derived from the asana. And some of those cells become endocrine. Some of them remain close to the ducts in small clusters or as single cells. They occasionally enter islets. It may be difficult for them to get into islets for reasons that I'll very quickly pass over in a slide coming up. But that's the situation with partial duct ligation alone. There is some evidence that some cells can move into the endocrine pathway. A lot of them move into a duct pathway. Some of them can go into an endocrine pathway, including beta cell that you push point out. We then added to partial duct ligation beta cell destruction. STC is a drug which kills beta cells selectively. And under this condition, we found a great acceleration of the differentiation towards the endocrine phase. Many of these acetides became ducts. Neurogenic tree was activated, again, similar this situation up here, but there's a faster and more transition towards the endocrine pathway. So far, under this situation, all of these endocrine cells here are duct-associated. They're not moving into the islet clusters. The islet clusters are being destroyed, remember, by STZ. I'm going to talk about that in a slide to come. And um, we do detect a population of beta cells in this endocrine pool who are mature. We have a variety of markers that say, I'm a beta cell, I'm an authentic beta cell, I'm mature. I'm reminded of that commercial on TV about mature cheddar, I won't get into that. Um, so um, we know that they look mature, we don't sort the cells out, we can't sort out the few cells that are present in this process yet. Okay, but those are questions for you to ask in a couple of years. Well, maybe in six months if you're unkind. Okay, so here's the situation, right? PDL, there's some evidence of this conversion, accelerated when you destroy the beta cells. It reminds me of the sort of things we did with Pedro Rare using diphtheria to remove beta cells. 
there's a very interesting hypothesis that we've come up with, and we have to test this, is that this could re represent a regain of an earlier multipotent state based upon PTF1A. The early multipotent progenitors were PTF1A, PDX1 double positive, remember? And even in the plexus stage, those tip cells that were remaining multipotent are PDX1, PTF1A double positive. This is the only cell type in the mature pancreas which continues expression of PTF1A. And it could be that there is a return to an embryonic multipotency state that's associated with this uh, fascinating trigger type effect, which was reported from Ray McDonald's lab. He showed that in the early multipotency program, PTF1A, here it is, the green protein here, is sat as part of a trimeric complex on target sites. RBPJ is the factor from notch signaling that you know well, the CSL factor from notch signaling, the transcriptional regulator, and another ubiquitous factor here. So this is the form of PTF1 called RBPJ PTF1, which is driving multipotency, and that there is an increase by this of transcription of PTF1, I'm sorry, of RBPJL. Notice the sister gene here. This factor, this complex, drives the transcription of RBPJL which means that the levels of JL compared to J increase over time, there's a switch out in the complex here, and these cells now enter an ASMA program. That's a nice kind of internal self-regulatory program for driving a cell from multipotency into uh, monopotency ASMA lineage. What we're proposing is that there's a possible return like this back to an RBPJ uh, condition, and we can make lots of experimental uh, questions come out of this test for the uh, absolute requirement for PTF1A in this. Can we see that there is re-engagement of RBPJ as part of a transcriptional complex compared to JL? But we have to get our numbers up a bit higher before we can really start getting into this, I believe. So again, just a very quick point here. New endocrine cell access to the islets under PDL plus STZ treatments might be unpreferred. Here's the setup here. This is the adult. These are the acinar cells. This is the central acinar cell pool in here. These are the duct cells. And these are these uh, small clusters of endocrine cells that you see in normal cells, in normal uh, adult pancreas uh, tissue, very often opposed to the ducts. Not just the big islet clusters, but you see often these little uh, guys here distributed down the ducts. When you add, uh, when you carry out the PDL type uh, injury to the pancreas, it seems that few of the cells can go into the uh, islet. Most of them try to join these uh, clusters down here. That may be because the, there's a very mature stroma in here, which is hard to move through. I'm drawing you a different structure down here in the embryonic state where there's maybe a softer, less mature, less developed, differentiated ECM. The cells are very close to the uh, lumen. These islet cells are still forming. These islets are forming. And so these cells can very much easily enter these islet clusters in the embryonic state. Here we're asking, can newly formed, de novo formed cells get into these islets? Maybe not through a, a, a more differentiated part of the penetrating ECM. And the idea in the STC is that there's basically a bonfire being set up in the middle of this islet with a sort of smoky debris ruins being a very inhospitable place for these cells trying to move. So they might very much want to go down here. Okay. But we are now getting towards a state where we can see that um, there, is a, like, there is a conversion. No transcription factors are being applied here. No extra growth factors are being applied. We're trying some beta cell destruction to enhance the rate. But even without that, what you're doing, seeing is some evidence for these cells being able to move into endocrine cell phase. I would say even though, and I've told you a couple times, that the rate is very low, I would remind you that uh, IPS conditions were in the beginning such that only a few of the millions of cells that the factors were applied to actually came out with the growth characteristics one was looking for. That's a screening process, right? You're looking for growth. You can screen out of two million cells, and one cell that becomes pluripotent and proliferative can be pulled out as a cluster. I think what we're looking at here is a sort of analogous situation. At the moment, this is the tip of the iceberg, and we will find ways of understanding the epigenetics and the reprogramming which is necessary, we can start to play games with small molecules to really enhance the rate of this and really push these cells in higher numbers so that we can start to interrogate them. And then we can maybe do a cyclical thing where we actually find in a way, a way of really controlling and tuning the levels of acinar to beta cell differentiation that we can get.
Uh, we, of course, are interested in the epigenetics of plasticity, the, the kinds of lineage relaxation uh, that are happening together with the, the transcription and co-regulator codes, which uh, all of you study here. So uh, I'm going to leave you with my very last slide, which is to say that the main message I want to give you is that the, the, uh, the pancreatic cells may be very capable of interconversion. Aciner cells can convert to duct cells. Aciner cells can convert to endocrine cells. Alpha cells, beta cells can be interconverted. I told you some experiments in my lab show that beta cells can be changed into somatostatin-producing cells. Maybe it's the most plastic organ in the whole body. I don't think that's the case. I just think we've really tickled the surface here, and we'll find ways of um, getting at the same kinds of uh, rules in other systems. If it is the most plastic organ in the body, it could be really important to understand that with respect to PDAC, pancreatic duct laminar carcinoma. There could be some link here. It's so plastic and therefore has this ability to make these massively, uh, a ter I mean, really a terrible disease. Right? If you get a pancreatic duct laminar carcinoma, you have basically a three month lifespan. You're lucky if you get past that. There, there's a sort of 12 month end time. But they're very dramatically multipotent when you get that. And that could be something to do with what's happening in these pancreatic cell types with respect to their epigenetic packaging. And uh, we want to increase control, learn if it could ever be applied in vivo, and certainly ex vivo, we might be able to apply some of these rules to IPS cells and in the in vitro methods of directed differentiation, find ways of switching cells in late stages, or even training the procedure towards the right pathway in the so mid phase of the differentiation programs. So that's my last slide, and I want to thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much. Thing. 
because that gives you an idea about how cells are talking to each other, what's most important in transitions, and then which cell to capture to then interrogate at the genome level and then develop this cyclical fashion of moving backwards and forwards. Okay. Yeah. So this conversion between alpha and beta cells, the late conversion that occurs during fetal development to birth, um, is there something going, I mean, what, what are glucose levels, how does the regulation compare in the fetal period to that after an adult? And there's some, obviously some communication between these cells. Is there something going on maybe with the central regulation of yeah. glucose levels or something that's feeding back? Yeah. I mean, not, not, I don't want to say anything else other than you're, you are thinking exactly the right way. It's, it's, you're so smart for saying that because we really are focusing on that. There is glucose regulation in the embryo is different. It's controlled by the mother, basically. And so you're now, what I meant by it's a stress to the animal to be, to be born. This is a stress. This is a big thing happening to the embryo where the entire get back into shape to refit to fix itself for the first time. And so I'm trying to sort of say that it could be an autonomously run program where if I take the cells out, they do it in a dish on their own. But I don't think it's that way. I think it's more like what you're saying. I haven't done any experiments to, to prove that yet, but we talk about this quite a bit. It's got to be something to do with birth, the changing of nutritional status and of regulation of the of the glucose. Good question for you. So, sort of along these same lines, so you have these different uh, ratios of cell types, for example. What's known about the non-cell autonomous mechanisms that are coordinating the appropriate numbers of these different cell types? Are they connected to each other? Are there influences yeah. from yeah. other cells? Or is it, you know, endocrine yeah. from outside? Yeah. Again, that's a really smart question, right? Because we actually don't know the answer to that one either. It's, it's just, it, I'm not, not joking, really. It's clearly we don't do enough experiments, right? How the <laughs> whole community can't do enough experiments. That's the right way of thinking. Um, OK, so the first year, I'll answer it this way. It sounds defensive. It doesn't mean to come out that way. The first real knockout of importance in the pancreas was done in 1995-96, right? So it's, a, it's still quite a long, it's 20 years past that, right? It's still the case that we don't have the right tuned, uh, regulatable systems to be able to do an experiment that would answer your question. And we are trying to sort of pioneer the development of some of those. What you need to do is create a system in mass, which is the same as Drosophila, where you have a variety of mosaic, inactivation, madam type methods can be used with these sorts of things. Uh, cell lineage tracing, watching single cells, watching small clusters of cells, how they behave, exactly into defining autonomous and non-autonomous influences, because balancing of cell types is an incredibly important thing. It's very important to us because we know that the balancing of endocrine cell types is different in the human compared to the mouse. But all those experiments we do in the mouse, I would also like to say we can do it all in humans, but you can't do that, right? But, I mean, we're thinking, at the moment, we're thinking about trying to build MADAM technology into this whole system. If anyone wants to know what MADAM technology is, ask me later. There's a question there. That's okay. Yeah, Chris. So, I have a question about the Something happening in that period. 
Right. And I want to know what's happening in that period. So we can't, at the moment, with the setup we set used so far, we can't sort those cells out and ask what's happened. Yeah, that's for sure. But so that means really those arms so you need to see over express GPS during the stage in order to run out there. Now, do, do they need to see it during the later stage? That's a different question. Yes. I missed that point. If that's what you were asking, yes. Yes. I'm done. So I got it now. So what you're asking is turn it on for this short period, then shut it down, and then see what happens. Right. And so that did that cause some triggering. That experiment can be done um, not in the, again, the setup that we did. You, you have to use an embryonically tuned neurogenin free doxycycline regulatable system, but we should be able to do that. We haven't got the system. Right, we haven't got the tools to be able to do that. But that's an important question. Transient activation, let it go, see what happens. Thank you.